Good morning. Tuning in from Costa Rica today. Uh, please let me know when, what degree or sign astrologically you are in the comments. So if you're a Scorpio, put Scorpio. If you're a Sagittarius, put Sagittarius. We're going to change it up a little bit today. Um, so let me know what your astrological sign is in the comments. Today is a 23 degree day in Scorpio. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of thoughts. We're rewriting our stories. Uh, Libra, Gemini, awesome. Lots of air signs already. Ah, okay, so we're gonna do some movements today and then we'll also bring up some people and have some discussions, work through some stuff. It's always fun to see what signs tune in each day. The moon's in Capricorn right now. I'm seeing a lot of Capricorns. Ah, okay, so we're gonna do a movement to start off just to kind of reduce the stress and then we'll get into some questions and bring some people up, okay? So we'll start off with a brain heart coherence. So we're gonna bring the two together because today there's a lot of thoughts. We're gonna balance it with our heart. So take your right hand, you're gonna place it on your heart. Left hand, you're gonna place it on your head. And we're gonna breathe together. So breathe in through the mouth. Two. Three. Breathe in through the nose. Two. Three. And then relax. Notice your body. I bit my lip the other day, so it hurts to talk a little bit. So if you notice, I'm talking a little bit differently. That's why. I started journaling after speaking with you. It helps me let it go. Yeah, journaling is really important. It helps you see where you, where you are and also um, see yourself. If you can see yourself, you can see your patterns. If you can see your patterns, you can create a strategy around changing them. And if you change them, then your life changes. Ah, so last night, I was, uh, I was brushing my teeth and very, very low light on um, because I don't like super bright lights at night. And I feel something like moving past my leg. And we're in Costa Rica right now in a different place. And, uh, you know, I'm used to having dogs around or animals or cats or whatever. And so I feel something kind of brushing up against my leg. And I'm like, oh, is that a, is that a dog? So I look down and I'm like, wait, why would there be a dog in my, in my bathroom? <laughs> So I felt something crawling up my leg and I started winging my, or swinging my leg around and it was a massive spider. So welcome to the jungle. <laughs> it's funny. Um, okay. And you know, I used to actually kill insects and bugs or whatever that was in my environment, even mosquitoes, but now I find whatever way possible to free them. Why did his voice just change? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there, there could have been a shift. Um, let's see, recovering from a concussion. Yes, I've had multiple concussions, actually, in my past as an athlete. So I've worked through all of them. If you do the fascia facelift on our YouTube channel, you can try it. It'll go through all the maneuvers for the face and the head and the neck. And that helps rebalance all the pressure. You can also do the eye balance and the vestibular balance on our YouTube. Those are all to help with the head, but we can do one together quickly and uh, have a little bit of fun with it. Today's a head day, so we want to actually shift that. Okay, so let's grab the left ear with your right hand. Left hand, you're going to grab the bottom of the right ear. Pull the bottom of the ear forwards. Pull the top of the ear backwards and twist it. Move your jaw around. Whew. Really twist it. It might hurt. Most people it hurts because you're really tight in your fascia. Play with like a baby's ear. It's like floppy. It doesn't like it just, you know, <laughs> our hairdressers, 
uh, or our barbers, when they, when they hold our ear down, they're like, they don't have to use any force. And they always get super freaked out because most people, they have to like really hold the ear down because it locks in place or it, it shoots back because it's so tight. Okay, Ooh, relax, shake that off. One of the things I just want to bring up quickly, there's a car, one sec, is that uh, if you want to DM us on Instagram today, uh, it's not going to work. We've been answering medical questions in our chats and we had a feeling that this was coming, but the things that we tell people in terms of how we answer questions in the DMs, uh, they actually turned our DMs off for 24 hours. So. If you want to reach out to us, uh, you can email us at support at humangarage.net and we'll answer your questions there for now. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a database on our website so that you can get all of your questions answered there because certain conversations are meant for certain platforms and because of the message that we're driving, the things that we're doing, uh, the nature of what we do, sometimes it's not going to align with other people's belief systems. So it is what it is, but if you don't, hear back from us or you can't message us in the DMs, that's why. But we're gonna be bringing it onto our website uh, shortly. We're working on that. We just found out this morning, so we'll get that up and running. Okay, let's do the other side. So left hand, grab the top of the right ear, right hand, grab the bottom of the ear. Twist it as much as you can. Really hard. Now, ears can be a little oily if, or sweaty or slippery for some people. So you can use gloves or a towel or tissue. You can put socks on your hands and then grab it. Okay, now move your jaw around. And relax. One of the other things that we're doing is uh, we're building a community. And we have about 80 to 100 people right now who are creating content using the human gras messaging or philosophy and sharing the message. And what we're doing is we're coaching them on how we create content every single week, once a week, we go through our techniques, our strategies, our pro tips, what works, what doesn't that we've learned over the last four years so that they can create better content and help more people. Now, as they create that content, we're watching the content and we pull the best pieces out and we collaborate it on our wall so that they can grow. So what's going to happen over the next year is we're going to have a thousand people around the world all creating content. And that content is going to be about you can heal your body, you can do it yourself, all you have to do is reduce stress, the way to do it is through the fascia, and, and, and decreasing your stress over time, removing the chemicals from your environment. And if we have all these people doing that, then we're going to have a megaphone. It's going to be a matrix of people that are messaging and delivering that message and it creates diversity. So if one person's account, whatever, doesn't work, or they, they, they no longer post, it's okay, because we have 100 or 1,000 people doing that. So if you wanna learn how to create content, and you wanna create content that's gonna help people, and you wanna support our mission, that's a way to do it, is to create content with the fascial maneuvers, or documenting your journey, or your testimonials, and sharing it with us. You can collaborate with us on our wall. And if you collaborate it and we like it, we'll review it and we'll actually reach out to you and we'll post it on our wall and collaborate with you so you can grow too. We wanna to support people helping people and by collaborating and using our audience to show who the people are around the world that are helping others but don't have the reach yet. So that's what we're doing behind the scenes. I just wanted to share that because times are changing over the next year, who knows what's gonna happen and to have a lot of people out there sharing the message collectively, we'll be able to make the impact that we wanna make. Okay, how's your concussion feeling? Let's do another one for the head. We'll do um, a really powerful one, actually. It's, uh, it's typically a C-section release is what we call it. But what happens is if the frontal lobe, you've got different cranial bones, okay? And what happens is they sit next to each other and as you breathe, they expand and then contract. Expand and contract. And if you put your hands on the side of your head and you breathe in super deep, you should feel your head, like a balloon, expand. If you don't feel it expand, there's too much compression and tension in the head, okay? So if you squeeze your head, try it. Breathe deep through the nose to the top of your head.
Okay, so you should be feeling that expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Now, the frontal bone right here, that gets stuck on a lot of people. And you'll see it. When you see their head, it'll have a shape out or it'll have like a dent in. And that means there's too much compression on the, on the frontal lobe. Because that bone, if it doesn't move when they breathe, then as you breathe, the brain tries to expand and every, all the tissue inside tries to expand and it, and it hits the wall, it hits the bones. So it can't expand. If it can't expand adequately, it doesn't get the blood, the nutrients and the oxygen that it needs to function. So what we wanna do is we wanna release the tension here, okay? And how we do that is you use your fingers like a claw, you're gonna grab your, your front bone here. You're gonna grab it like this, and you're gonna pull it down, okay? So find the hairline, so just above the hairline with both hands, and clench. Pull the skin down, and with your thumbs, you can kind of pull up a little bit, like a claw. Really tight, do the best you can. And you're, think of pulling the skin, like stretching the skin down. Okay, now that you've got it, slowly look up, breathe in through the nose deep. You can rotate a little bit to the side, breathe in. Go to the left. Okay, look down. You can curl your, or pull your toes up. So towards your shins, pull your toes up and then look down and breathe. You can rotate a little bit right to left. Okay, ha. my hair is getting long. Okay, so feel that. Now, if you feel a rush of blood, like a big rush of blood there, that's a good sign. That means that, well, well, maybe not a good sign. It means that you were compressed and there was too much tension there and your brain's not getting enough flow. Now, if your brain doesn't get enough flow in the frontal lobe, it's pushing pressure down into the amygdala, which is your fear, it's your fight or flight fear mechanism. And, and that causes racing thoughts, anxiety, uh, it causes depressive thoughts. So you do not want pressure here. This is a movement you can do as much as you want especially if you're a C-section baby or if you've had hits to the head. And a hit to the head might not be what you think. Just even when you do this, you know when as a kid you go and you hit your, you hit your forehead because you, you feel stupid or you did something dumb? You're hitting it and you're actually creating a minor concussion or minor a trauma to the brain. Now, as a kid, sometimes parents shake their kids because they're angry at their kid because their kid doesn't understand them or doesn't stop crying. And that shaking motion can be enough to create head trauma. So it doesn't have to be a lot. It can, it can literally just be the tiniest little bump that can create trauma and restrictions in the head. And that creates issues long-term. Now, the reason why someone asked, why do we lift our toes or pull your toes towards your shin? Because as you pull your toes towards your shin, you're changing the pressure distribution in the head. A good way to, des to describe how we use pressure mechanics as we move and how we see the body is the body is broken up into three zones. So you've got your head, your, toes, your torso, and your legs. And those three zones work together in harmony. So for example, another way to look at it is my leg, okay? So my, for, my upper arm here, my humerus, is the same as my femur in terms of pressure mechanics. One is in the upper part of the body, one is in the lower part of the body. It's mirroring each other. The other one is your calf or your shin and your forearm. Those are the same pressure zones, but one's in the upper quadrant, the other is in the lower quadrant. My wrist is my ankle, my elbow is my knee, my fingers are my toes, my hand is my foot. And so they work together. When I take a step forwards, I'm moving pressure in my body into the left side. 
Now, as I move it to the left side with my lower quadrant, my body goes out of balance. And there's multiple ways to come back into balance, but one of them is to move the opposite arm forwards. So think of it now like, a, like I'm a sphere or a balloon. If I drive pressure into this side of my balloon and I rebalance it up here, now my body is balanced, it's in harmony. So that's how we walk. When you walk, boom, these two pressure zones sink. Boom, these two sink. And that's how I can maintain a central balance. If I don't do that adequately, what happens is if I, if I step forward with my left leg and I drive all my pressure there, but for whatever reason I don't have an arm or it doesn't work properly, I have to drive pressure using my shoulder, my neck, and my head opposite, and then move my head back. And you're always trying to find that midpoint. I'm seeing some connection issues. I'm just gonna keep going, do the best I can here. Your body's always trying to find a midpoint, okay? Now, one of the ways that you'll see people have issues when they're older, if you see an elderly person walk, they use the same, they use the same dynamic in their fingers. So if I have an injury on one side and I'm falling over, right, because they're out of balance, they clench their hand on the opposite side. So if I'm falling to the left and I clench my right side of my body, it balances me. So I'm falling, clench, balance. Now I walk with clenched fingers. And you'll see some elderly people, like they'll clench one hand or some fingers, depending on which pressure zone they're trying to compensate for. So if I, if I clench my thumb, I'm compensating for the pressure zone in my big toe on the opposite foot. So you're constantly using these, like fine tuning with movement. These are, the, this is also one zone, Zones one, two, and three are also in your finger. Zone one, two, and three. Zone one, two, and three. So they're all connected. You have three zones in each quadrant of the body. And as you generate pressure in one, you compensate and generate pressure in the other one. That's why if you have an ankle injury or a foot injury, you work on the hand and the wrist on the opposite side. If you have a knee injury, you work on the elbow. If you have an ankle injury, you can actually work on the side of the jaw here because this is the same shape as your foot. Hang on here, huh. right? It's the same shape. So that's why when we do the fascia facelift, it's actually working on the rest of the body. So that's how pressure works within the body. We have, basically we have fluid, we have matter, and we have air inside of us. And like a tube of toothpaste, right? And you're moving it around as you walk, that, to that toothpaste or the fluid and the air is moving into different compartments and it's balancing constantly and that's how we move. So what we've learned is there is something called atmospheric pressure. That's when an air molecule like this has gravity acting on it. That molecule with gravity hits your body. And it hits your body on every part of your body, which creates an outside pressure, which squeezes your body like this. But what we do is we expand up against it and we stand and we can walk. So there's a balance between the pressure outside of me and the pressure inside my system. When you go up in an airplane, when you go up in an airplane, what happens is there's less air molecules on you, there's less atmospheric pressure on you, which means you have more pressure now inside you than outside. So you have to rebalance. If you go up really fast, you'll feel it because there's too much pressure in, not enough pressure out, and there's a, there's a, there's a disharmony between the two and your body has to rebalance it. How do you rebalance it? You use your pressure valves. Burping, your ears, your... Uh, there's a, a atrial valve here or a aorta. There are, sorry, there's a valve here. I can't remember which one. Sorry, guys. And then the last one is, uh, is your, your anus. And those are constantly changing pressure through the body. So as you go up, 
The outside pressure changes, you have too much pressure inside, boom, your ears pop. And that helps you rebalance the pressure inside versus outside. Now, how do you use this to your advantage? If you use breath through movement, so if I pin and lock an area of my body and I breathe all this air in, I'm pumping up more pressure inside and then I move. Now, all of that pressure has to move into different compartments. So if I lock one compartment, if I lock this and I breathe really deep, the air can't get to here. So that means all the air is going to here. So it forces a change in this area because none of it can get here. So you can use pinning and locking of the fascia with breath to create expansion in the body. Another way we use this mechanism is we dive deep under the water. Because what happens when you dive under the water, you have the weight of the water crushing your body, which means you have to create internal pressure and push back. As you create internal pressure and push back, it creates a balance and that creates expansion because literally the, the deeper you go, the more water you have on you, the more water you have on you, the more weight. That means that your body has to generate more internal pressure. If it's generating more internal pressure, that means it has to expand more. So when you come back out of the water, you feel like, like almost like, like loopy, like everything's expanded from the inside all the way out from the bone out. And that's why we dive and we actually dive upside down because when you go upside down, this is the hardest zone of the body to release pressure because it's smaller. So when we dive upside down, you have the most pressure on the head because you have the most water on the head. The most water weight is crushing the head and then you have less on your feet. So if you do it that way and you have headaches a lot or concussions or issues in your head, you flipped upside down and now you're creating that release there. So that's the way to start to expand your body from the inside out. Okay. People say my eyes, the dark circles, I've had that since I was a kid. And uh, I don't know why. I mean, I had, uh, I had allergies and asthma and all that stuff. And I've worked through all of that. I've worked through all of that. I've had multiple concussions. I've had multiple broken bones. I had poor digestion. I was stressed. I wasn't able to process information properly. And I've worked through all of that. So although I might look skinny, I didn't eat for 44 days. And does my body actually need that weight? If you look at studies, the people who weigh less and eat less live longer. So am I underweight or am I actually proportionate to what my body needs in order to function in my day-to-day -day life? Now, if I had a more strenuous life, like I was an athlete, then my body would adapt to the strain that I put on it. So it all depends. And there's a stigma around how we should look and what healthy looks like versus what it doesn't look like. And that's actually the issue. It's how you feel. When I didn't eat for 44 days, I felt really good. I was an athlete my whole life. I was built with muscle and I was, I was very big. And, and it was you know very low body fat. And I went from that with a lot of pain in my body, poor digestion, um, tension, stress, poor thoughts, to the opposite end of the spectrum where I fasted, moved through all of those emotions, moved through all the detoxing, moved through all the negative thoughts, moved through all the negative emotions, to where I am today, which is balanced. And no matter how much I eat, what I eat, when I eat, or what I eat, my body doesn't fluctuate, which means my body's found a new balance point. And I've gone through this a few times with myself when we did the fast for 44 days and I lost all that weight, I had an ego death because I was building my body like a machine based on a, an image that society built for me. As an athlete, I played soccer my entire life. I played baseball. I played a lot of sports. I, you know, I was told that you got to go to college, get a good education. You got to be fit. You got to be an athlete. You got to go to the gym. You got to work out. You got to, you know, do your hair. You got to look this way. You got to dress super nice. You got to do all this stuff. And I did all that stuff and I was very good at it. And I got to the top of it. And then I realized that I wasn't happy and I was miserable and I was unhealthy and I wasn't living in my best life. So I went to that peak point where I played professional sports. I had a college education or university education. 
I had a girlfriend, I made good money, I had a good job, I lived in my own place, I did all of that. And then I had a wake up moment where I was like, this is not the way I'm supposed to live. If I'm, if I'm this tired, if I'm this upset, if I'm this miserable, if I'm not around the people that actually understand me or doing the things that actually light me up, that's the issue. And I ate everything I was supposed to, I worked out like I was supposed to, I did all of that. And I got to a certain point and that woke me up. And I was very angry at first when I woke up because it was like, no, this, there's a different way to do this and I'm gonna find a different way and I'm gonna share a different way. And when I did a fast for 44 days, I didn't fast just from food. I had to fast from all of the programming. You have to look this way. You have to have muscle. You have to work out. You have to eat food. You have to do this. You have to do that. Why? Why do I have to do those things? That doesn't make sense. So I wanted to test it. I wanted to see for myself. I wanted to create my own belief systems and I went and I did it. And through the process, I went from like, I was a big guy. Like I was 210 pounds of muscle and, and very athletic. And I, all of my clothes at the end of the fast were falling off my body. It was quite funny. And for 44 days, I didn't look in the mirror. So I didn't really understand it because your body, your brain makes everything normal over time. So if I'm not looking in the mirror and I can't see myself, it just felt normal to me, but I had more energy. I was sleeping less, but I was more energized. I was more active. I was more focused. I was more calm. And so I was doing that. I didn't have to go to the bathroom. I didn't have to eat. I didn't have to go get groceries. I didn't have to clean up. I had one trash bin for the entire 44 days that wasn't even used. And I had, so I had all of that while simultaneously I was losing this weight and I couldn't see myself and I didn't look in the mirror. But one day I remember we were jumping in the lake and I jumped in the lake and my shorts almost fell off and I'm like, whoa. And I looked down at myself and it was the first time I'd looked down at myself and it had been a, probably about a month in and my clothing was falling off my body. And then I was like, oh man. And then people were making comments to me. You're so skinny. You need to eat. You're, are you okay? Your body's going to break down. And it was like, okay, uh, do I listen to this fear? And it really, it really tested me. Do I believe in my feelings and how I feel? Or do I go with what I've been told and other fear that's coming at me externally and saying, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. Your kidneys can break down all of this stuff. So I had to work through all of those emotions. Simultaneously, I had to work on my ego because my ego told me that I was supposed to look a certain way and be a certain way. And if I was going to listen to my ego, which I did for the first 26 years of my life, and it ended up with me crashing into a wall. So I had to do it a different way. And, and this way was to listen to my feelings in my heart, not, not my brain, not my ego, not social programming, not society's way of living. And so I had to go inside and work through all of the emotions of have, I was, I went from 210 pounds of muscle and steel all the way down to like 140 pounds of bones and working through the emotions of not having that anymore after all that programming was my ego death. And that ego death for me was the, was a pivotal point of my journey. And since then, I think I've probably gained like maybe 10 or 15 pounds and I eat way less, but I eat mindfully and I have more energy and I sleep better. My digestion's better. My thoughts are better. My emotions are better. So I'm going to continue to listen to how I feel. And if I listen to how I feel, it will be my compass. Because if I, if I listen to it and pain comes up, the pain is giving me information that something is up and I need to go in a different direction. Or I need to change something. We've done a lot of things, a lot of experiments over the last four years on our own bodies. I didn't want to listen to what other people did because yes, I can do a study on something and I can pull the data on it, but I can also manipulate the way that the data is interpreted. If we're all sitting at a table and we all have a different seat at that table and a story is told, when we walk away, everybody's gonna have a different perception of what was told. Everybody's gonna have a different story after. And that's what we're focusing on is, is that everybody has a different story and everybody has different data points. Some people were focusing on the emotions that were happening at the table. Some people were, emo were focusing on the, the story that was being told. Some people were focusing on the music that was playing. We all have different data points. We all have different perspectives of what's going on and we all tell our own stories. So if I'm doing a study 
and I'm studying what happens to the body over 44 days of fasting, and the only thing that I'm measuring is my blood test, or my pH, or my uh, what's in my urine. If I'm doing one test, I have one data point, and that one data point will give me information. And then how I interpret and how I read and how I tell the story about that information is science. And so what we're doing is we're saying, let's give this a try ourselves. And I'm going to document how I feel and what my journey is. And I want you to do it. And I want you to do it. And I want you to do it. And then report back. And it's creating our own method of science where people are having their own personal experiences. They try something and they report back. And we have a conversation about it. It's not about who's right. It's not about who's wrong. It's your experience. And if you had that experience, who am I to take that away from you? There is no right or wrong here. It's your experience. There, there, there is no, you have to eat this way. There is no, you have to do it this way. It doesn't work that way. The body is a very strong computer and it has trillions of data points. Trillions. And if it has trillions of data points, it knows exactly how to modify itself so that you're in harmony. If you stub your toe, your body's going to make a thousand or trillion calculations to figure out how you can walk and move the best so that you can heal that toe. Now, if you come and you put an external input or external therapy on it, the body goes, hey, I had the best calculation. I was working on it right now, and you just interfered and put more input in. Now I'm going to take that data, and I'm going to create a new formula, and I'm going to punch out a calculation that optimizes where you're at so that you can heal and perform at the best and, and that's what the body is capable of doing. And then we take like one data point, your pH or your urine or your blood test or some sort of genetic sample. And that's a minute amount of data. And we make stories about that data and that data that informs us what we're going to do with the body. It just doesn't make sense to me. Let's do this. Let's go to the most natural things that the body does anyways. Let's move. Let's breathe. Let's fast. Let's replenish with the nutrients that we need. Let's have connection with people around us. Let's be in nature. We've got cold water. You know, there's a lot of things that help the body heal on its own. And we don't need technology. The body is the strongest technology. You, you need People go to sound therapy and sound baths. Well, you can... You can hum on your own. You can create the sound yourself. So where am I going with this? I feel like we're going back to the fact that the body can heal itself. And we're going back to the most natural forms of healing. And you look at a lot of the therapies that are altered slightly or changed slightly or frowned upon are actually the ones that are the most healing. So you have the ability to heal yourself. And there's a lot of people who have shown that. And you can do it by meditating. You can do it with breath work. You can do it with cold therapy. You can do it with fascia maneuvers. You can do it by sleeping a lot. You can do it by fasting. If you look at the things that kill you the fastest and do the opposite, you'll know that you're on the right track. Like if you don't breathe for a period of time, you die pretty quickly. So that means that breath is a very high priority when it comes to healing the body. Probably actually the highest because you can go months without food or potentially forever. I've heard people go forever. I don't know if I am fully there yet, but I know that I've heard people can do that. Some people say you can only go a couple days without water. I know that's been invalidated by our own tests. And then you've got air, which I have not tested how long I can go without air. But you've had people like magicians and David Blaine's of the world who've gone a long time without air. So if we go to the things that kill us the fastest and we do the opposite, we'll know that we're in the right direction. So if I overeat, that's going to kill me pretty fast. So if I do the exact opposite, which is I don't eat, that's going to help me heal. If I over chemicalize my body, that's going to kill me pretty fast too. If I stop moving, sitting in a chair all day, stop, like we don't walk anymore. The thing I love about Costa Rica is you have to walk a lot and there's a lot of hills and it's not strenuous, 
but it's enough to keep the body moving. And actually, I'm going to tell a story quickly and go off track for a second. Whenever I've gone hiking over the last four years, I've paid a lot of attention to the emotions that people feel as we're hiking. And the people who were the most emotional before the hike, even if they were the most fit or most prepared to actually do the hike, had the hardest time. They were breathing super heavy. Their heart rate is super high. And the question is why? Because they were under the most stress. They were holding the most emotions or their body was under the most restriction or their body had the most stress in it. So what's funny is as you're hiking up the hill, you, feel, you can feel the heart rate going. You can feel the lungs going. You can feel all the emotions like I want to give up. I can't do this. Can I go back? I don't know if I'm going to make it. And all you, then there's frustration then there's sadness. Like I'm not good enough. And Oh, I can't believe I can't do it. And then the judgment comes in and then all the thoughts and all the emotions. And then all of a sudden it goes boom and you feel calm and you feel relaxed and the conversation with people that you're hiking with changes and you notice this shift. Everything went from like complaining and upset and frustrated and tiring and hard to like flow and easy and calm and happy and joyful. And it's like, when you do that enough times and you're paying attention and you do it with groups of people, it's actually really funny to watch. So we did this, we went on a hike yesterday, we went on a waterfall and we're walking and we're walking barefoot, okay? Most people do not actually walk barefoot. This is the best shoe on the planet. It's basically almost indestructible, it's waterproof. I can clean it super fast, it doesn't stink it, or it doesn't hold on to stink. And, uh, and it has the most grip. It was really funny. So we're hiking this, this waterfall yesterday and we're walking down the trail and this guy comes up to me and he goes, oh man, you're doing it barefoot? Good for you. Like that must be really tough. I'm like, actually it feels really nice. It's like a mini acupuncture for my feet. And my feet get to actually move instead of this like brick. And then my foot has no movement. I'm just moving like this. My foot is actually... I get to move my bones and my joints and all zones in my toes and my feet so that it actually goes up the chain into my ankles, my hips, my knees, my shoulders, my neck and my head, my hands, my, sh my elbows, everything starts to open up because of that. So I'm walking barefoot and this guy says that to me and uh, in my head I'm kind of laughing because I know the advantage of bare feet and he goes, just watch out, the rocks over there are really slippery and uh, good luck and, uh, and I'm like, Really? Like, if you really knew the truth. So we get there and we're hiking on these rocks and, uh, and I'm watching people as they're hiking and they all have shoes on and they're all slipping like crazy, like they're on an ice rink. And I'm standing there like, just walking, like no problem. I'm jumping, I'm running, I'm hopping from one rock to another and I have all this grip. And so what was happening is my, my, your body over time learns how to adapt to the environment. A shoe doesn't know how to adapt. A shoe is built for one precise thing, either to have a lot of grip or no grip or comfort or make you taller or have padding and protect you. But my foot will say, oh, it's wet. Okay, we're going to start to adapt the fascia there so that it creates a bubble so that you can move better or creates friction so you can move better on the water. So my foot was adapting to it. The other thing is a shoe, if you go on a sharp point, it has to go like this, right? Oh, sorry. But my foot can go like this, right? My foot can mold on that. Most people's feet can't. They step on that and it goes, oh, that hurts. But my foot now, after a couple of years of going barefoot, when I hike, goes like this and it molds to the environment and then I go off. And that means that I'm actually getting movement through my foot. If you move through your foot, you move through the ankle. If you move through the ankle, you move through the hip. It just goes all the way up the body. So movement actually becomes healing. But if I have that shoe, I'm constantly coming to a head and going like this, I get no movement in the foot which means the movement has to stem up into the ankle. And if the ankle doesn't move, because maybe you've got a high shoe there, then your knee has to do the movement. Now you're overloading the joints there. So, 
Anyways, my foot's adapting. People are slipping like crazy because they have shoes on. And it didn't start that way. My foot had to learn how to do that. It had to learn how to grip. It had to learn how to mold to the environment. And it had to learn how to um, actually experience a little bit of sensory input. Because when I used to take my shoes off and I'd walk on a little bit of gravel, I'd be like, ow, 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 ow. And that would hurt. Now when I do it, it feels good. So Costa Rica, the environment here is a little bit more challenging to walk on barefoot than where we were previously because it has quite sharp, sharp edged rocks sticking out of the ground. And the first 10 minutes were a little bit tough for me on the first day, but at the end of the hike, it was easy and it actually felt good out. It feels like, a, like I'm walking on a cloud because your feet start to feel quite padded. And when I finished the hike, I had no tension in my shoulders and my arms anymore. So if you're not walking barefoot, try it a little bit. And especially when the ground is not flat, because if the ground is like this, when I step, my foot really only has one angle it can create. But if it's undulated, like if it's got rocks and edges and, and tree stumps and it or grass, then my foot can mold and creates different movements. So my first step is a movement a little bit to the left and a little bit forward. My second step is a little bit to the right and twisted uh, forward or backwards. And, and that creates movement through the joints in a healthy way over time, which then heals the body. That's why walking is one of the most healing mechanisms. So anyways, here we are, we're, we went on the hike, we got to the waterfall, we swam around, we're on the way back. And Maxine, she's seven years old. She wore barefoot shoes on the way there. She wore bare feet on the way back. And, uh, and so we're walking back and now it's uphill and it's a little bit more challenging and she's getting all emotional. She cried and she was frustrated and she wanted to stop and, and, and she was working through all these emotions and, you know, almost like a, I can't do this. She actually said at one point, I give up, I can't do this. And it was, it was quite challenging. And anyways, we ended up getting to the end of it and we go to dinner and when we were having dinner, she was in the pool by herself. I mean, we were there, we could see her, but she was in the pool playing by herself, floating around in daydream land, in La La Land, calm, by herself, not asking for anything, not bothering anybody, not asking anyone to play, not asking for something to distract her. She went from, I wanna play with everybody and do everything and have conversations, constantly on the move, constantly asking for things, that's what kids usually do. And then all of a sudden we did this hike and all these emotions came out. And then we get into the, she gets into the pool and for an hour and a half, she didn't say one word to her mom. Not one word to nobody. She was just like this, smiling, looking up, super happy. Isn't that wild? And it's like, okay, here's one option is a medication that suppresses our children. The other one is walking and movement, which brings out emotion, motion to move. We bring out all of the emotions. I can't do this, I'm frustrated, I'm not good enough, I'm tired, I wanna give up, I'm crying, I'm angry. Boom, all these emotions that I've been holding for months comes to a head because now I'm being stressed in a healthy way. Boom, it explodes. And then when I get back, I'm calm and I'm relaxed and my body feels good and I feel light and I can move and all my pains are gone. That is nature, that is healing, and that is free. And that's something that anybody can do. And that's really what the message I wanna to drive to people is, there's nothing wrong with using certain things along the way that are man-made or that are more, uh, more external. But there is a point where you can go into the, the most natural mechanisms, which is moving your body, breathing your body, meditating, doing fascial maneuvers, fasting. I mean, these are, fasting is the same thing. The first three days are super emotional. If you know you're gonna do it for five days, you're counting every day. And you're the emotions, when can I eat? What, ah, I'm frustrated, like I, I wanna eat, I wanna satiate, I wanna, and then all the emotions come up, they come up, come up, come up, come up, come up, boom, release, and then all of a sudden you go right to clarity, right to calmness, right to focus, right to energy. 
Breath work, same thing. If you do an intense breath work, all the emotions come up. They come to a head, release, and then now you're relaxed. The, the reason why we have disease in the body is a number of things. One is lack of movement. Two is lack of breath, which is a movement. Three is over chemicalization in our environment. Four is not putting replenishment back into the body when it's needed. Five is we're not expressing or managing our emotions adequately. Like you see a child, when they have an emotion come up, what do they do? They kick and they scream. You see an adult, what do they do? They shut up. They push it down. They suppress it. They wait until they get home to get it out on their family or their friends or their, you know, themselves. So when we express those emotions in the moment, we get them out. Now we move into the next experience. Fresh. But if I bring that emotion with me into my next experience and then that next experience, I bring them that emotion with me. Now I, my cup's full and now I'm in stress. Now any external stressor makes me want to pop overflow. I can't handle this. I feel overwhelmed. I'm going to snap at you just because of something like this. Like when you're, when you're driving and someone has road rage and it was over the smallest thing, you know that they were at a peak. Their cup was full and you just, you just were the little tip of the iceberg. You just pushed the ball over the hill for them. And now they're releasing all their emotions. So you're actually participating in their healing. You're just the trigger. You were there, you stimulated them to go over so they can finally release all of those emotions at a stranger where there's almost zero consequence, hopefully. There's zero consequence. Now when they go home to their family, they've released 80% of their energy. 80% of their emotions that they were holding can be released through road rage or driving. And that's actually a common thing. Driving can be quite meditative. It can be quite healing. Okay. Um, there's something else I was going to say. I got distracted by some comments. So if we can express our emotions moment to moment, or we can move through them moment to moment, using breath, using movement, using expression, uh, using social connection, um, using self-awareness, then you go into every experience fresh. Now, one of the things that this is a big one in society today is the archetype of victim blame game. Okay. So I have an emotion about a situation that happened when I was four years old. I held on to it. I brought that into my life. Every, I run into the same situation at seven years old, at 10 years old, at 15 years old, at 17 years old, at 20 years old, at 26 years old, at 29 years old. Now, as those situations come up, the person or the stimulus might be slightly different. It might be my boss, then it might be a friend, then it might be a stranger, then it might be a family member, all bringing up the same trauma for release. So they trigger me or they create a stimulus which brings all the emotions that I had from that first event that was not processed and the event after that was not processed and the event after that was not processed and it just stacks. Now it comes up again. And I point all of that built up energy at that one person. And I say, you made me feel this way. You did this. You're the reason why this happened. And it goes into blaming. And I'm the victim. I had no control over this. You did this to me. And that is a dangerous game to be in. You do not want to be in the victim blame game. You are responsible for how you feel and how you react moment to moment. You are responsible for taking care of yourself. You are responsible for how you see the world. Now, that person, there's two ways to look at this. You did this to me, or you helped me recognize something that was deep inside of me so that I could choose differently, I could heal it, I could move past it in a new way. If I choose this way, I'm going to repeat it again. If I choose this way, I'm in power because now I'm taking responsibility and I'm saying there's something that you did that made me feel this way. Why do I feel this way? 
oh, I've had this feeling before. I remember when I was younger, that this feeling came up when this person did the same thing to me. And now you're bringing, you're bringing this situation up for me again, so I can see myself, see what happened, see what I didn't process. Now I have a moment where I can process this and I can choose differently. I can create a new life for myself from that place. Whew. If someone brings up emotions in you, it's you, not them. Otherwise, you're taking your emotions and you're saying, here, Sally, okay, take my emotions. And when you want to make me angry, don't put your dish away. When you want to make me angry, don't listen to me fully. When you want to make me angry, don't text me back right away. When you want to make me angry, do something that I told you not to do. When you want to make me sad, stand me up, don't show up, Be, arrive late. So I can't control any of that. I've taken all my emotions, I've handed it to them and I say, here, on a platter, make me feel the, want, the way you want me to feel moment to moment. Make me feel sad, make me feel angry, make me feel fearful. fearful. The other way around is make me feel happy. You didn't do this? Oh uh, no, if, you do, if we can do this together, I'll be happy. <laughs> Good luck, because what happens if they don't do it? Well, does that mean you're not going to be happy? It's a dangerous, dangerous game. And, and it's, a, it's part of the experience and it's this necessary game to play so that we can learn how to take back our own power again. So if I, if I become a fully self-sufficient system, that means that anything that's external to me is amplifying my already self-sufficient system. So I'm, I don't like codependence. I don't like dependence, I like interdependence, which is, to me, that means I'm fully independent and self-sufficient. However, I have systems, people, and things around me that do the things that I don't like doing or I don't want to do or I don't want to use my time to do so that I can do more of the things that I want to do. And if at any moment that external thing disappeared, and it landed on me, I could do it because I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. I hold my emotions. I get to manage how I direct them. I get to manage my perceptions of it. I have the choice. If I choose that this trigger is a learning experience or that this trigger is a blame experience, you're gonna get an experience from that. Your choice. It's okay to sometimes choose the blame one. It's okay to sometimes choose the, choose the I'm gonna take responsibility for this one. They're both an experience, there's no right or wrong. It's good to have that experience. I had that one multiple times and I'm like, I'm gonna go this way. Thank you for that experience. I no longer want that one in my life. I'm gonna go into the, I'm gonna take responsibility one because then I feel like I can change my reality. But if it's always someone outside of me or always something outside of me, I have no control over that. If I say, if I'm late for work today, I will be angry. And then there's traffic. I could leave early. I could take the detour and I could still run into traffic on every single detour on every single street that I go to. Well, now I'm angry because I set myself up. I set an expectation and tied in my emotions to that expectation, which means if I don't meet that expectation, I'm not living it. I'm not, I'm going to experience emotions that I set myself up for, the opposite end of it. That's why being present is so important. But if I'm not enjoying the present moment, then it makes me wanna look in the past or the future, which then creates more emotions, which then sticks me in a cycle. So the way to do it is to come into the past, the present and the future at the same time. And there's different ways to get there. One of the ways is to bring your body out of stress. Because when your body's in stress, there's so many inputs. Heal this, change this, move this, modify that, send resources there, turn this down, use, and it starts to play this, this, this game of chess. And as it does that, that drives mental traffic. If you have too much mental traffic, that can stimulate the ego and the brain 
to start to project into the future what you want, what you want to do, what your life's going to look like. I don't want to be here. I'm too stressed. I'm overwhelmed. And it starts to create the overwhelmed feeling, the overthinking feeling, the over ego feeling. So that's the first step is bring the body out of stress. And there's so many ways to do that. One of them is fascial maneuvers. Bring the body out of stress. The body feels safe. The body releases emotions and trauma and tension. Then all of a sudden, it starts to feel calm again. Now, if you're calm, from that lens, you now have a lens on. That lens that you see the world through, you see the world through a certain lens. If you're stressed, you see it through one lens. If you're relaxed, you see it through another lens. That lens that you have on dictates your life. So if I'm in stress and I have this lens on, everything's rushed. Everything's uh, ride or die. Everything's fight or flight. Everything's like, you know, there's one option. I need to go this way. I have to do this. I, I got to get there on time. But if I'm calm, I'm going to put that lens over there. I'm going to put on a new lens. and I'm going to be like, wow, isn't this so beautiful? And I'm not even looking at the time. I'm just absorbing this moment. So that is a way to do it because you actually become present in the moment. You're not looking in the past because you're present and enjoying the moment. And you're not looking in the future trying to change the moment. You're just there. You're just being, human being. The other one is when you're no longer in your thoughts and you're out of stress, you go into a daydream state. And in that daydream state, you can create. And when you're creating from that place, you're actually not creating from the past. You're not creating from the ego. You're not creating from the future. You're creating from the past, present, and future at the same time. And that daydream state, you can move pieces. I used to do this when I was uh, in my early 20s. I worked for Lululemon and I, I did visual merchandising and all that kind of stuff. And so what I would do is I would take different pieces of the store, like architecture, and I could move a couch here, I could move a mannequin there, I could move clothing here, I could move this color up there, I could move this to the front, I could move this to the back, I could watch people walk in, how they engage with it, I could watch how they felt when they engaged with it, I could feel the flow of the energy, I could move pieces really fast without using any energy. I was moving in the energetic world, not in the physical world. So I could move things in lightning speed and put it in any format that I want. And then I would feel what that format felt like. And then I would know that this is a match that matches the feeling that I'm looking to create. That's the place in which creation takes place because you're creating from imagination. When you're a kid and you go into school, they tell you, they tell you to focus. They tell you to be at tension, to pay attention. That's to create tension. That's to focus on the, on the moment right in front of you. But if you're in that daydream state, you can create whatever it is that you want because there is no container. Anything's possible. You're not using physical energy to do it. If I was to move this space around, it would take me, you know, I got to move that chair. I got to pick that up. I'm going to be sweating because it's pretty hot. I'm going to put it over there. I'm going to move the, you know, move the container, move the fan. And that's going to take time. And it's also going to take a lot of energy or I can do it in my imagination. I could see all the pieces. I could move them in different places. I could feel what each place feels like. And then I could pick that feels right. Now I do it in the physical. So I'm creating in the energetic and then I can act on it in the physical. And there's a movie or there's a TV show that did this, The Queen's Gambit. If you haven't seen it, what happens, I'm not going to ruin it, but what happens is she projects the chessboard on the top of the ceiling in in holographic figures and she moves them. What happens if I move this piece here and this piece here and this piece here and this piece here and this piece here? And what happens if my opponent moves this piece here? And it just, and she plays all the different versions in like seconds. And then she looks at the board and she moves the piece because she's gone through every single possible angle imaginable in seconds through a daydream state. And she used the feeling to match that feels right. That's the way to go. That's how you do it. And that, that saves a lot of energy because we're doing so much in the physical world. The physical world is the last part. If you're emotional or you have a lot of energetics that are off, your physical body will show that years later sometimes. 
it takes a long time to get to that point where your body shows it in the physical form. That's why when you fix the physical body, but you don't focus on the energetics, it comes back. The physical body is a symptom of the energetics. And if the energetics are right, then the physical body will reflect that. That's what we're focusing on here. So you can achieve way more in that daydream state. Now you can get there in so many different ways. Go out in nature, hug a tree, breathe more, meditate, do fascial maneuvers, take toxins out of your environment, all that kind of stuff, okay? We go through it in our 28 day, we go through it in our programs, we go through it in all of these lives. We're just here to share that there's another way to do things. It's, it's not necessarily the right or the wrong way, but it's a way that we found that achieved a path or a goal that we were looking to achieve. And I want every single one of you to feel like I feel when I wake up in the mornings, because I feel energized, I feel awake, I feel in a daydream state, I feel like I can create from that place, almost that will now. When before I had to like meditate for 45 minutes, I can literally close my eyes for 30 seconds and I'll get to that place now. But that was because I took all the stress out. I took all the stress out of my body so that I can go to those states at will. And that's really what I want for everybody here. Um, so if you want to find the replay, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel. If you want to DM us on Instagram right now, we've been answering medical questions. Unfortunately, that didn't align with the values of the platform. So we will be taking the questions to our email support at humangarage.net for now. We're going to move all of our information to our website. So that becomes a central hub for information. So you can go there irrespective of the platform and you can consume content. We're starting to move that over there. We're gonna have a medical database there where you can type in what you're dealing with, what you're experiencing, and we're gonna give you a quick little synopsis. Here's the 10 things that you can do in order to help yourself most effectively. And what you're gonna find is that we almost say the same thing every time. Manage your emotions, move your body, remove the chemicals, replenish the body with what it needs fast. And we might be a little bit more specific and say, do this reset program, do the lower body reset, do this movement. We might give you a little bit more specific, but you're gonna see the same patterns of answers over time if you start to look at those medical-based questions. And you'll also be able to educate yourself if you wanna learn this stuff and say, what do I do if I have this? Like, what happens if you have tinnitus? What are the 10? quickest things that you can do to help yourself, we'll have that there. So you can go and study that stuff and you can share that with your clients. You can share that with your friends, your family members. So you can start to learn for yourself and help others and become a self-sufficient system. So with that, I'm going to call it a day and uh, enjoy a little bit of the, hold on, hold on here. Let's see if I can share. So this is the Shala that we're on. Let me, uh, so this is basically where we do our morning movement. And uh, this right here is where the sun comes up. Hang on. So the sun comes up over here and every morning. And, and we really believe in seeing the sunrise every morning. We've been taught to be afraid of the sun. The sun is one of the most powerful healing forces on the planet. It helps, you know, our plants and our food and everything grow, helps your body grow. So we, we, we go into the sun, we sun gaze every morning. We do our fascial maneuvers here at 530 in the morning. And then we have our cacao and, uh, and connect with each other and learn and, and help hop on lives and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, get out into nature, enjoy yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you.